Balancing your personal life with your professional life is key to making your ambition work for you. Home life, work life, they must work together. Making sure that what you're going for in your career complements your home life. Making sure that what goes on at home complements your career. One won't work well if the other doesn't. Lady gets into work early in the morning, is the last one to leave every night. This keeps going on week after week, month after month. Doesn't seem like she gets that much more accomplished than everyone else. Matter of fact, it seems like she's using the office to escape from home. Something's wrong here. Better fix it. Chances are that whatever's bothering her at home is affecting her work anyway. A guy's always late for work. Always takes off during the middle of the day to go home. There always seems to be some sort of emergency to tend to at home. He takes long breaks, leaves early to go home. He's not getting his work done in record time. He's not getting anything done at all. Chances are he's using the emergencies at home as an excuse to stay away from the job. If something's wrong at work, fix it. If you can, or look for your solution elsewhere. If something's wrong at home, fix it. If what's going on at home is the result of neglect, admit it and fix it. Pay greater attention. If you need to go to counseling, go to counseling. Talk with your minister. Talk with a trusted friend. But remember that whatever the problem is at home, it probably didn't happen overnight. So make sure to give it some time in the healing. Be patient. Now there's a balance between work time and home time, professional time and personal time. They both have to be working well in order to maximize your ambition and maximize your potential. Problems at home affect work. Problems at work affect home. Even when things are going well in both areas, sometimes special circumstances call for the work time to take away from the home time. And if that's the case, make sure everybody at home knows when to expect the light at the end of the tunnel. And if that extra project is really taking away from the family, make sure your family knows that their time will be paid back with interest. Psychologists have found two major things that we as human beings get the most happiness and satisfaction from. Two things. Number one, our work our contribution to society, our continued progress toward reaching our goals, our activity that generates our lifestyle, influence, power. And number two, love. The love we receive from our spouse, our children, our parents, our families, our friends, knowing that one person or several people care about us, want to spend time with us, the professional goals that you've outlined for yourself take a lot of work. Your ambition takes a lot of work, discipline, skills, constant learning to improve yourself and develop yourself and improve your skills and develop your skills. You don't expect that your achievements will come to you on a silver platter. Working on the wish and the hope and the prayer philosophy? No. You know that your goals require constant attention and discipline every day. Or they'll what? They'll never come to you at all. You can't just come home at night after work, after a long day, and expect that your family life is growing just fine all by itself. You can't just expect that your personal life will grow and flourish without attention, without taking time to feed and water and weed out the bad stuff, the negative stuff that happens while you're away. No, creating the perfect personal life Family life takes just as much attention as creating the perfect professional life. It takes love and nurturing and kindness and sincerity and caring. It takes all those things. And that's one of the biggest mistakes that happens today. People spend all their time, focus all their energy, give everything they've got. They give it all to the job. It can't work that way. Your family requires more than that. The investment we make in our personal relationships before they're put on paper 
is the investment we must continue to make. The more we give, the more we get. If you stop giving, guess what? You'll probably stop receiving too. So keep your investment in relationships and family active. That's part of the good life. What good is a mansion on the hill if you've got no one to share it with? It's no good. What good is an investment portfolio worth millions if you've got no one to share it with? It's no good. What good is working so hard day after day, month after month, year after year, working, working, working until you accumulate everything you want and in the meantime, your family left you? It's no good. It all loses its value. Life has to be balanced. Work hard, play hard. Work six days, take one day off. Work three months, take one week off. Life has to be balanced or your lifestyle will suffer. Life without balance can cost your relationships. Life without balance can cost your health. Life without balance can cost your spirituality. Life without balance can cost your wealth. Happiness. Balance. Work on a balanced life. Work on balanced ambitions. If you're a believer, don't neglect it. Study and practice if you're a believer in spirituality. Nourish, study, and practice the art of spirituality. Because we learned before that the great destroyer of all of us is neglect. Starts like an infection, becomes a disease. One neglect leads to another. Starts spinning out of control. Here's one thing to consider if you've neglected your spirituality, if you're a believer. Now, I'm not asking you to be a believer, but I'm asking that if you are a believer, do not neglect that part of your future. Study and practice as diligently as you study and practice ambition and parenting and skills and success in the marketplace. Faith helps sustain ambition. Here's what else plays an important role in your ambition, your physical side, your health. And here's some of the best advice I've got on the physical side. Ancient scripture says, treat your body like a temple. Excellent advice. Treat your body like a temple, meaning something you'd take extremely good care of. A temple, not a woodshed. No, a temple. And here's why. The mind and the body work together. You've got to have both functioning well. Here's one of the best ways I've come to look at it. Your body needs to be a good support system for the mind and the spirit. A good support system that can take you where you want to go, support you with strength and energy and power and vitality. Here's a major part of success, vitality. I'm telling you, some people don't do well simply because they don't feel well. Now, feeling well is a personal responsibility by taking care of the temple. It's the only place you've got to live. Your physical body, cherish it. Ancient scripture says this, sometimes the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. See, that's a sad combination, a willing spirit and a weak body. You can't think of a much more pitiful combination. You wake up in the morning and the mind says, let's go get them. And the body says, I can't even get out of bed. You now have to have a conversation with your body that says, that's the last time you're going to fail me. Give me the excuse that you can't get out of bed. I'll drive you to your knees to do push-ups until you're exhausted. I've got these plans for fortune and enterprise. And there's one thing I'm going to demand, a strong, unbelievably powerful support system. From now on, I'm going to have a support system that will take me wherever I want to go. Support me with power. Support me with vitality, strength, uniqueness, zest. Anything less than that? I will not settle for. I'm telling you, you've got to take care of this physical side because it's so important. Be conscious of self, of your support system. Be conscious of self, but not self-conscious. Don't work on it too much, more than you need to. You don't have to spend six hours a day to have a good support system. You don't have to. 30 minutes a day, one hour a day, and you can have a strong, healthy body. Exercise, 
You can do just a few simple things. Take the stairs instead of the elevator, unless you're on the 50th floor in New York. When you're looking for a parking space, don't look for the one that's right by the front door. Park a block away and get a little bit of exercise. But here's the best exercise program in the world, the one that'll work for you, the one that you'll do, the program that won't bore you or hurt you. If you don't like to jog, if your joints can't handle it, go for a walk. If you don't like to walk, take up swimming half a mile a few times a week. If you don't like exercise that seems like exercise, get into a sport like tennis or racquetball or basketball or softball. You don't have to do too much, just enough to keep your body a good support system. Here's what else happens when you participate in a regular exercise program. You just plain feel better, not just your body, but your mind. It's kind of a paradox, but the more physical activity you do, the less sleep you need. The more physical activity you do, the better your mind works. We've all heard of the runner's high. Well, it's true. 20 to 30 minutes of sustained activity starts releasing endorphins in our bloodstream. And endorphins are our body's natural secretion of morphine. No wonder they call it a runner's high. It is. Take care of the physical so that it becomes a happy support system. It'll have the muscle and the strength and the vitality to take you wherever you want to go. Accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. Develop a good support system to take care of you and make all of your dreams come true. Because you've got to have the physical. Okay, and here's what else you need to pay attention to in the physical. Those things that could hurt you. Like overeating and smoking and too much alcohol. These things can destroy your temple just as surely as pure neglect. Now, a fine glass of wine with dinner is one of the joys of life, lifestyle, but drinking too much too often will tear down your temple, and it'll do more than that. Drinking too much at business dinners or social dinners will end up alienating you from the professionals who know their limits. Make sure you know your limits. A fine glass of wine, yes. A bottle of wine, probably not. Know your limits. Pay attention to your behavior in the marketplace, lest it cost you more than you'd like to pay. It's all about balance in life. How your ambition in the marketplace translates into a balanced life at home. If you're giving too much at work, pay it back to your family with interest. Balance. It's important. If you don't have balance, you have what? You'll end up paying too high a price. Sacrificing your family for your work. Being careful with your clients and careless with your children. Without balance, there's a price to pay, and we must all pay the price. And sometimes the price is just too high. So evaluate the price before you begin. What must I give up to achieve this goal? What must I become? Evaluate it all. Now, do you think your disciplines at work can affect your personal life? Do you think the skills you perfect at work affect your personal life? Of course. The skills you bring from work have an enormous bearing on your personal life. All disciplines affect each other. Nothing stands alone. Everything affects everything. Everything matters. Yes, there are some things that don't matter as much. But there isn't anything that doesn't matter. Nothing at all. Be not casual in your approach to life and business and family. Don't be casual. Everything matters. How you treat your children will undoubtedly affect how you treat your clients. How you run your office will undoubtedly affect how you run your life. Now, I'm not talking about the incredible feelings of accomplishment. I'm talking about the tangible rewards of ambition. How wealthy should you be in knowledge and in spirit? as wealthy as you possibly can be. How rich should you be? In dollars and investments, as rich as you possibly can be. Now, I'm not talking greedy. I'm talking reward for success at the service of others, not at the expense of others. Is it okay to strive for success? 
Is it okay to strive to become rich and wealthy? Many people struggle with the concept of being rich. Rich people lack morals. Rich people are cutthroat. Rich people don't care. No, that's not true. Now, some rich people lack morals, are cutthroat, and don't care. But a lot of poor people have those same traits. So corruption is not inherent with being rich or wealthy. Corruption is inherent with gaining at the expense of others. Corruption is evil. But wealth is not evil. Wealth says discover your own talents and use them and take care of them. So your own talents and skills and gifts can take care of you. I firmly believe the more that I ponder this topic of wealth, I firmly believe that it's our natural destiny to grow, to succeed, to prosper, and to find happiness. So here's what I've learned to do to temper the words rich and wealthy. I call it becoming financially independent. That's a little easier than rich or wealthy. Because some people have this idea that to be wealthy or rich, you've got to misuse people. You've got to tell lies. You've got to throw away values. If being rich bothers you, don't pursue riches. Some people even tell me that the Bible says it's hard for a rich man to reach heaven. I say, well, that language suits me. It didn't say it was impossible. It just said it was hard. I don't mind a little hard stuff. I'm also reminded that the Bible says the meek shall inherit the earth. But where does it say that in order to be meek, you have to be poor? No, the Bible doesn't say you have to be poor. That's just an interpretation. A poor rationalization that lazy people use. People who need to justify their lack of progress. People who will give up in the midst of any adversity. People who don't even try. For everyone that's born in America or comes to America, here's part of your heritage. The opportunity to become financially independent. In a nation that's full of hope and promise, it's our heritage and our right and within our reach to realize all the best that exists, including personal wealth. So let me give you now, by definition, the meaning of financial independence. And kids go for this because this is simple language. Financial independence is the ability to live from the income of your own personal resources. The ability to live from the income of your own personal resources. That I describe as financial independence. Now, one part of it is how you want to live. Some people need millions for all the projects they've got going, all the causes they support. And here's what's exciting about America. What if you decided you had to be rich to do all the things you wanted to do, go all the places, support all the projects? What if you had to be rich? Are there books on the subject? Yes, of course. There's plenty of information on how to be rich. But if you don't have to be rich, you probably won't read the books. What drives you to go get the books is if you have to have the money. Now, some people don't need much money. I understand that. Some people lead modest lives. But financial independence, that, I think, is every American's heritage. Someday to become financially independent. The ability someday, someday to live off the income of your own personal resources. Wow, it's freedom of the most exciting kind, financial independence. Now, to get there, I assume that you've got this money thing settled, that it's okay to be rich and wealthy. It depends on how you earn it, of course. Success at the service of others, not at the expense of others. Wealth by rendering wealthy amounts of service. Everybody has got to weigh this for themselves. I understand that. But let's say that you'd like to go for becoming financially independent. Here's number one. It's a matter first of philosophy. The philosophy of the rich. Rich people invest their money and spend what's left. The difference in your economic future is going to be not the economy. The difference in your economic future is going to be your philosophy. 
So now let me teach you some of the best philosophy I know. What to do with a dollar. To begin with, never spend more than 70 cents. And here's a good plan for the remaining 30 cents. I suggest you take 10 cents out of every dollar and give it to charity. Here's why nothing teaches kids character better than generosity. It helps you teach so many things. Generosity, supporting worthy projects, taking a piece of what you've been blessed with and turning it back to help people who can't help themselves. Worthy projects, charity. And the time to start is when the amounts are small. I'm telling you that if a kid understands this, he'll give you a dime out of every dollar. Once they understand, and it's easy to give a dime out of a dollar. It's a little tougher to give a hundred thousand out of a million. Somebody says, oh, if I had a million, I'd give a hundred thousand. I'm not so sure. That's a lot of money. We'd better start you early so you'll be ready when the big stuff comes. So 10 cents for charity. Here's the next 10 cents. 10 cents for active capital. Active capital. Active capital to try to make a profit. We live in a capitalistic society where the money belongs in the hands of the people, not in the hands of the government. So you should turn part of your wages into capital and turn capital into a profit-making enterprise. It can be a piece of property. It can be anything. Buy, sell. It doesn't matter what it is. Try to show a profit. And this is where I teach kids how to have two bicycles, one to ride and one to rent. Active capital fund. Because here's what I teach kids. Kids will be happy to learn this. Profits are better than wages. Kids need to know that. The benefits of living in a capitalistic society. Kids can start a Kool-Aid stand before they can get a job. Kids can clean out their rooms, have a garage sale to earn some profit. It doesn't take a kid long to figure out that profits are better than wages, better than allowances. And that's what America is all about, a profit. And here's what's exciting about making a profit. You can make a profit long before you can legitimately earn a wage. There are no limits. Your profits can sometimes accelerate much faster than your wages. Teach your kids early. Profits are better than wages. Wages make you a living. Profits make you a fortune. And we should all try our hand at making a profit since we live in a capitalistic society. How long will it take to triple your wages currently? A while. But profits, there's no limit. My gosh, once I understood this, I went bonkers. Profits. The whole world benefits if we all leave more profit. Leave a profit. Make a profit. I talked to a man who rents a lot of apartments. He said, Mr. Owen, you wouldn't believe it. Most people, when they leave the apartment, it's trashed. I said, you've got to be kidding. He said, no. What a reputation. Everything you touch turns to trash, gets dirty. Got to turn that around. One of the best ways to train yourself is to leave a profit. A friend of mine has made money on every car he's bought. Why? Because when he traded it in or sold it, it was always better than he found it. It was always better than he found it. The key for parents is to touch a life and leave it better than you found it. Touch a business and leave it better than you found it. Touch a job and leave it better than you found it. Whether you stay six weeks, six months, six years, always leave it better than you found it. Make a contribution. Leave a profit. What a world this would be if everybody left a profit, not a piece of trash. Now here's the third 10 cents. And you can become as wealthy as you want. The first 10 cents goes to charity. The second 10 cents goes to active capital. And the third 10 cents is for passive capital. Passive capital means let somebody else use some of your money. You're the passive partner. 
They're the active partner trying to make a profit. They'll pay you interest. And one of the most valuable things for your future is called compound interest. Nothing more valuable. And I suggest 10 cents for passive capital. Let someone else use it. Pay you interest on it. Now, here's what else I teach kids. It's a Bible philosophy. And here's what it says. The borrower is servant to the lender. Excellent information. The borrower is servant to the lender. And if you've taught this properly and ask kids, what do you want to be? Here's what they'll tell you. They'll say, I want to be one of those lenders. That's the power position. If you're interested in power for the future, influence for the future, being ruler over much, I'm telling you, the key is to be one of those lenders, not a spender, no, a lender. Now, if you can't reach this little formula right now, if you can't start here, here's what you do. Start where you can and work toward it. 70, 10, 10, and 10 is the ideal. And it doesn't matter if you're trying to lose weight or to get your health in order or to get your finances in order. Next in building your financial independence is to keep strict accounts. You've got to know exactly where it comes from. You've got to know exactly where it's all going. Don't fall into the I don't know where it all goes trap. Don't fall into that. It just gets away from me. No, keep strict accounts. It's much easier than it used to be with personal computers and so many households and the software that's readily available. It's as easy as entering your deposits and checks and receipts, and the computer will tell you exactly where you stand. And it does more than that. If you're really wondering where it all goes, the computer will tell you that too. Most of the programs let you categorize your expenditures, print it out, and you'll know exactly by category where it all goes. And when it's right there in front of you, you'll be able to evaluate what you're buying and what you're wasting. Take that wasting part and add it to one of your capital funds. It'll get you there that much faster. And here's another part of building your financial independence. It's a matter of attitude. First is philosophy about money. Second is attitude about money. Here's the best attitude. All of us must pay for democracy and freedom and free enterprise and a marketplace and a country second to none with gifts brought here from all over the world. I finally became a happy taxpayer. Once I was educated, you say, well, they misuse it. What do you care? That's not going to make any difference in your future, is it? That's not going to greatly reduce your chances to become rich and powerful. It shouldn't make any difference at all whether they misuse it or not. Sure, we need to vote well so the country is run as well as possible and there's as level a playing field as possible, but what if there isn't? I'm telling you, you can't base your life on that. Vote well and then chart your own course. Vote well and take charge of your own life. We've all got to pay. And after you pay your taxes, pay yourself first. Take care of the 30% first, or whatever percentage you can start your plan with. Take care of the stuff off the top first, and learn to live off the rest. Make your investments, whatever size they are, before you pay your bills. Give to charity before you buy the extra things you want. A man I know has an MBA from Harvard and an engineering degree from MIT, smart guy, semi-retired now and doing what he likes best, teaching. He teaches college courses in economics and business planning. But when he teaches economics, he also teaches personal economics. This is what he starts his classes with. Decide how you want to live now versus how long you want to work. Decide how you want to live now versus how long you want to work. This means if you want to spend everything you make now, you'll have to work longer and harder. If you spend everything you make now, you'll have no choice but to work longer and harder. 
But if you start investing in your financial future now, you'll have the choice between retiring early or traveling more or continuing your career or starting a new career later in life. Once again, it all comes down to choices. Think tomorrow today and live better tomorrow. Here's the next thing to think of when you're planning your economic future. Be careful with your credit cards. Selling money is big business. You probably get invitations in the mail to sign up for a new credit card a couple of times a month. Having some credit cards is important, especially if you travel. It's safer than cash. It's easier to track than cash. But be careful. I know that's hard. When you buy something with a little piece of plastic, you don't feel the effect until you get the bill. So make sure that whatever you buy, you're still happy with your purchase after you get the bill. And be careful with credit. It's the easiest way to get into debt. Go into debt strategically, not habitually. If your business is high risk, if you're an entrepreneur whose career requires a great deal of risk, and a great deal of strategic debt, keep the debt in your business and out of your personal life. I know this one's hard too, because for most entrepreneurs looking for capital, the lender requires you guarantee the debt personally. So plan your debt just as you plan your fortune. Here's another point to remember in becoming financially independent. It's hard to get rich fast, it's easy, to get rich slowly. 70, 10, 10, and 10, or whatever percentages you're working with, it doesn't happen overnight. With conservative investments, it takes a while. It takes discipline to keep adding value to your future. A little every month, a little every month, a little every month. It takes time to build your fortune, your financial independence. There's a saying about investing, Time, not timing. The saying says time, it takes time. Now, if playing the stock market is what you do, then you know that timing is a whole other ball game. But for the average person, it's time. A study was done a while back that analyzed stock market investments. The study took two scenarios into consideration. The first one took place over 40 years. In the first scenario, stocks were bought at the very worst possible time and sold at the very worst possible time. Bought high and sold low. And after 40 years, the average return was around 10%. Scenario one dealt with time. Now in the second scenario, stocks were analyzed over a 10-year period. The second scenario dealt with timing. Stocks were purchased at the best possible time and sold at the best possible time. After 10 years, the average return was around 10%. Be patient in building your financial independence. It will come small steps at a time, little advantages after little advantages. It's hard to be patient. But it's just like building your ambition and achieving your goals. It happens one step at a time. And what if patience has nothing to do with building financial independence? What about those trust fund babies that are handed their financial independence on a silver platter, never having to work a day in their lives? First car is a Porsche. First house is a mansion. First job is at daddy's company. What about those people born rich? Some guy says, It isn't fair that I'm working like crazy all day, all week, all month, all my life. It just isn't fair. I'll never have that kind of money. Well, some things aren't fair. Inheriting money. But what does that have to do with you, really? If your goal is to have greater financial independence than some of those you know, then you'd better start working harder and smarter on your goals, your own visions, and stop pondering what's fair and what isn't. Start examining what's keeping you back instead of what's keeping them ahead. Start looking at what you're doing. Start looking at you instead of it. 
There are plenty of stories and examples and experiences of people who began their careers destitute and had enough resolve to do it until, until they had more than they ever dreamed of. Study the experiences of others who built their way to the top instead of those who were born there. And what if you decided you had to be rich? What if you really followed the power of your ambition and your life started turning around? Well, aside from getting on the right track, increasing your earning potential, decreasing the percent you spend, increasing the percent you save, invest, give away, aside from all the benefits of achieving, there will also come some disappointments. Disappointments in the circle of friends you started with. One of the disappointments that come from achieving all you can be is in the people who choose to remain right where they are. They will chastise you for your accomplishments. They will abandon you for trying to become better. They will remain behind and say, boy, he's forgotten us now, now that he lives so well. And they'll probably say more than that. They'll probably gather in their little group and say all sorts of things to justify their own mediocrity. But remember, those who choose to stay behind have chosen their own path, an average path, a path of mediocrity. And those who have climbed above the crowd almost always wish they could return to their earlier friends, to embrace them in friendship and love and try to help them get out of their ruts, to share ideas of hope and inspiration. But it rarely happens. Jealousy builds a big wall, one that is almost impossible to break down. So as you change, your life will change. Your friends will change. Your circle of influence will change. And that's part of achievement and ambition and success. An ever-changing process required to become the person worthy of reaching your goals. There are many reasons why people don't build their ambition, strive to become better, be the best they can. Many reasons, but it only takes one. We talked about many fears in an earlier session and how to work to overcome them. But here's one we didn't talk about. Risk. Different professions call for different levels of risk. There's an old saying, no risk, no reward. Maybe that's the case in life. I don't know. It's a personal decision, one you have to make, regarding how much risk you're comfortable in taking with your life and your future and your money. It's a personal decision. What I do know is that there are different types of ambition, different types and each has its own reward. The ambitions of a salesperson are different than the ambitions of a manager. The ambitions of a manager or an executive are different than the ambitions of an entrepreneur. The ambitions of an entrepreneur are different than the ambitions of an artist or a scientist or a teacher. With different levels of ambition come different levels of risk and different levels of reward. Salespeople are probably more able to handle risk than managers and professionals. And the higher the risk, the higher the earning potential. Entrepreneurs are probably even more risk-oriented. They have to be. An entrepreneur's ambition must overpower the risk of losing it all in an attempt to gain their dream. Your level of ambition may or may not be equated with your ability to take on risk. Most people can't deal with so much failure to reach success. There are only a few people, even among the most ambitious, that have the tenacity, intestinal fortitude, tolerance level to follow a risky ambition. Whatever the level of ambition, whatever the level of risk, there must always be the discipline to overcome the failures and see the end result. To keep trying until... Jonas Salk kept working through his failures until, until he developed the polio vaccine. Whatever your level of ambition, keep doing it until, until you get there. The riskier the ambition, 
the greater need for stability in your personal life. If you've got everything on the line in your business, you'll want to make sure everything is in line at home. Remember, the first step is to define a plan. It may not be ideal, but you're taking the first steps. And when you follow your plan, the money you put away today will help you build your financial independence tomorrow. And with financial independence, the result of your ambition, the reward of your ambition, with financial independence comes freedom like you've never known before.